Yeah. So, Adullam is from 1 Samuel 22. It's simply talking about David's story. David became a mighty man in many ways. Now, of course, he wasn't perfect, as you guys know. There's actually a book called David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. I found that book after I found another one called Outliers, which was also a very interesting book. They give you some perspective as to uh, just different stories of people's lives and how people ended up where they ended up. And so, anyways, Outliers and David and Goliath, very good books. And I'm going to talk about a few more books that are interesting and worth exploring. But in David and Goliath, Malcolm Gladwell tried to tell the story of David fighting Goliath. And he, he, he's telling the story from a historical perspective, even though he quotes, he quotes the reference in the Bible. But he actually tells it from a historical perspective. Do you know that there are certain people who say, well, no, I don't read the Bible and this and that, and that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. How do you know the Bible is true? Well, here's the thing. There is actually history that is there. There's actually history that matches up with it. And so he's telling the story of David and Goliath, and he actually talks about the fact that there's medical anthropologists who have studied David and Goliath to try and understand why David beat Goliath, just from a human perspective. But the question was not whether or not it actually, it actually happened. It was just trying to, trying to understand how it could have been that way. Nobody was questioning that it happened. Do you see my point? And yet there's some people who think, well, if it's in the Bible, it's not true. I'm serious. There's some people that literally don't want to take anything the Bible says true because it's in the Bible. But no, if it's true, it'll be true outside the Bible. So if there was a man called David and a man called Goliath and they fought and it's true, then if it's not true, it is true. The Bible says it's true. But it's true because it's true. And I know that sounds strange. So here's the thing. If something is true, it's true because it's true, not because something else is false. I repeat, if something is true, it's true not because something else is false. Why is that important? Because I've heard people say, well, I don't believe in creation, so evolution is true. Mm, no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. If it is true, it must be true on its own terms, not because of the falsity of another. So creation is true on the basis of its own terms, not because evolution is false. Do, do you guys get this? This is really important because people treat truth as, okay, because this one doesn't work, this has got to be it. No, no, no. There's three tests for truth, and I know this is a quick commercial, but notice I wrote logic and philosophy. I was going to talk about that, uh, about logic and philosophy. Things are true for three primary reasons, according to philosophers. Is there some evidence to it? Uh, well, they actually, I'll say the three names, and then later we can write it down. But existential relevance, empirical adequacy, and uh, cons logical consistency. So if something is true, it must be logically consistent logically consistent. If it's not logically consistent, we have a problem. Now, I want to give you a warning, and actually, we are going to talk about that, so I won't get ahead of myself, but we're going to talk about this issue of logic and how much many people have met. Now, I've met one guy who told me one time, hey, must stop using logic. It's all about feelings. I'm like, you know, you can't tell a mathematician, philosopher not to use logic. It's hard to be a philosopher these days when people don't want to think logically. The professor I was talking about, which I will mention his name, is Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is a professor who is challenging people about their assumptions. He's, he got in trouble in Canada because he would not do certain things. But he's challenging them, and he's not doing it primarily from a Christian perspective. He's doing it from a logical perspective. So logic, can, you can have someone who doesn't even believe the Bible, who speaks about logic. And so I want to challenge you with that, because Jordan Peterson, not only has he been doing what he's doing, he's... People are so excited about it. He has a daytime job, and they're donating $50,000 a month to him. Why are they giving him $50,000 a month? So he can help remove some of the textbooks that are destroying young people's minds. I didn't make that up. Look him up later. $50,000 a month so that he can help with the young people's minds being destroyed at certain colleges with two certain books. So with that money, what he does is that he's creating a program that sifts through books to find out if it's illogical. Some things are not logical, my friends. And I'll give you a very good example in a second. I was a chemistry major minding my business and I heard people talking about a philosophy professor who is a friend of mine, by the way. We're still friends. We still talk. And I went over to him and I said to him, hello, sir. My name is this and um, I, I believe the Bible is true and I've heard some of your lectures and you know, I've heard from people I just want to let you know that I, you know, I believe the Bible is true and I am a Christian and, and I believe what I believe. And he said, so you believe in Genesis? And I said, I do. And we talked about that. Okay, take my class and let's talk more. That's what he said. This was about um, probably September of 2008. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll take your class, philosophy of science. 
I enrolled in philosophy of science. January, I show up to class. Never taking philosophy as a class. Again, I was a philosopher. You don't have to take courses to be a philosopher. So I was a kind of this self-trained philosopher just because I love to read, which is part of why I have some of these books. One of the first books we read in the class, listen, you'll find this interesting, it's called What is This Thing Called Science? That was probably the best class I've ever taken in my life. Because what happened was we read What is This Thing Called Science? And there I am, a chemistry major, who didn't have to be in that class. I didn't need a, a minor. I was fine. I had a major and I could have graduated. Fine. But I thought, he wants to talk, so let's take the class. So I go into the class and we read a book called What is This Thing Called Science? And guess what happens in the book? I'm sitting there as a chemistry major. Most of the other people are going into law. They're going into this. And you have this chemistry major. And there I realize that science actually doesn't have an objective definition that everybody agrees on. I'm like, really? Yeah. And so they go through the history and the philosophy of science. They talk about the fact of a guy called Thomas Kuhn. They talk about all these people. And I'm sitting there going, wow. And then somebody actually told me later, that philosophers and scientists in certain circles actually don't get along. Because the philosophers, you know, the scientists might think this about the philosophers, and the philosophers think that this about the scientists. And apparently there was a conference where they almost got into a fight. I said, wow. And then I'm sitting there going, I like both. Let's talk, you know? And so anyway, so, I took, so that was the first book I read. He gave us an assignment. I wrote, a, I wrote my answer to the assignment. Um, he, he graded it. And then we read the next book called Evolution. Uh, the Remarkable History of a Scientific Theory. That's the name of the book. So the class was the philosophy of science and we studied evolution in depth. I, I, didn't grow up, you know, I didn't grow up in a country where people study evolution as in depth as America, but I said, sure, again, if something is true, you don't have to be afraid. I, I'm not gonna be afraid going into the class going, my heart is beating, oh, is creation true? Because what happens if I find out it's wrong? That you don't have to worry about that. You just, you, you learn. Socrates said that it's interesting and it's nice when a man can talk to somebody he doesn't necessarily agree with and at least have a conversation with the man. I paraphrased what he said, but that's what Socrates said, uh, uh, part of what he said. And so we read the book Evolution, and then we read a book as a rebuttal to evolution. Okay? It, was, uh, it was called Darwin on Trial by Philip Johnson, who's a lawyer. You're wondering, why is a lawyer writing a book about Darwin? Well, part of the problem goes back to the 1920s. Inherit the wind. In the 1920s, there was a guy who actually taught evolution. I haven't watched this movie to the end, or I've had it, I need to get it, I need to watch it soon, but um, he got in trouble for teaching evolution in school. And it went to the courts. It, it, so he got in trouble for teaching evolution. It's reversed now, by the way. You get in trouble for teaching creation. Uh, many schools, uh, you can lose your job. Depending on your circumstance, you can have a PhD and be fired. That's not a hypothetical, I'm speaking from facts. Um, I have friends who have lost their jobs because of it, because of the evolution discussion. So we read, what is this thing called science? We read that one, we, re we, we, we read Darwin on trial. And it was during that class, I had a lot of opportunities to ask questions. To, you see, the, the nature of truth is that I don't need to tell you, hey, excuse me, um, you're wrong on that issue, or I disagree with you on that issue because of what I believe. There's something called deconstructing arguments. You can deconstruct a person's argument without giving any of your proposition. And that's what I did in the class a lot of the time. I wasn't necessarily saying, I have a problem with that because I believe this. I was saying, no, sorry, um, you said that, but that's not logically consistent. And one of those times, somebody made a comment. I feel like we're stuck, we're in a maze. We don't want to believe creation, but we're stuck in our faith of evolution, basically. That was someone who said that in the class, who believed uh, that. And so I'm sitting in the class, I go through all this stuff, uh, and I, I wanna give you two examples so I don't forget, and I'll make sure I come back to them. The first example would be as far as Darwinism and why there was an inconsistency, and then the second example would be a more uh, rigorous topic, which is the question of worldview. So this happened in this class. The professor said to me one day, Amos, let's be friends. And I, like I was gonna be done, I didn't have to take any more. Like, I, I appreciate our friendship, and, and, and it's been wonderful, whatever. After he retired, he still emails, and we hang out sometimes. We go talk, and he knows where I'm at. But see, I'm not saying that some things are inconsistent in the evolutionary paradigm because of Christianity. They're inconsistent because they're inconsistent. I'll give you one example. 
in that paradigm of evolution, why is this important? Because most Americans would say that they believe in evolution and, and that that's how they came to be. But you have to really think about what that means. Before I tell you what that means, let's write this law on the board. The law of non-contradiction. Law of non-contradiction. And, and because there's so many mathematicians in the room, I'm actually going to draw a truth table for a second. So, Okay, a man by the name of Aristotle lived about 300 BC. He was friends with Plato, who was friends with Socrates. So Socrates was one of the top guys. You guys might have seen a picture of a guy who's sitting down, they give him something to drink, and he actually died for standing for what he stood for. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle lived about 300 years before Jesus. Okay, sometimes people don't have any timeline reference. They actually lived before Jesus, Greek Empire. And Socrates is the famous for his quote, an unexamined life is not worth living. Anybody hear that quote? That's Socrates. Plato is famous for a lot of things, including possibly the person who started the modern, well, the university, Plato. Aristotle was the tutor to Alexander the Great. Okay, everybody get the timeline? Aristotle was a big line, but I mean, a big guy, big deal back then. Uh, I believe he was a tutor to Alexander the Great, which, by the way, there's a huge debate in philosophy of religion and stuff that Daniel actually wrote about Alexander the Great before Alexander the Great existed. And some people actually debate, like, uh, the book of Daniel must have been written after. But the evidence actually shows that it was written before. So Daniel predicted Alexander the Great's coming. Read the book of Daniel. Read about this empire. When Alexander the Great died, you guys know how old he was? About 29 years old. He conquered the whole world almost. 29. And Daniel talked about him. When he died, his empire you know, did what Daniel said he would do. So one of the laws that Aristotle gives is a law of logic called the law of non-contradiction. It doesn't matter what a person believes. This law has no business with your belief system. It has to do with itself. Here's what the law says. On a truth table, if I have a proposition P and a proposition Q, for example, Amos plays soccer. That's a proposition P. Q might be Amos plays tennis. Okay? So can P and Q be true at the same time? Yes, I can play soccer and I can play tennis. These are very simple examples, but I just wanted to see if you see where I'm going with this. Okay, now, if the proposition P is negated, instead of going with P, I'm going with negative P. If it's negated, that means Amos does not play soccer. Okay, what the law of non-contradiction says is that for every time you have a truth of a proposition that is, you cannot have its reverse at the same time, in the same context. My friends, is that rocket science? No. If something is true, it can't be false at the same time. Straightforward, right? Well, we become very intellectually lazy. And so what is the better way to handle problems? You believe in proposition P, and I believe in proposition negative P. But both of us are right, and we can get along. My friends, there is never a time to harass people because of what they believe. This is not a call to tell someone, oh, you believe differently, so I'm not going to be your friend. Or, well, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you a hard time. That's not what this is about. This is about truth. If something is true, then its opposite cannot be true at the same time in the same context. A lot of college professors I've met do not believe that. That's a problem. So what they're saying is that contradictions are okay. That was not my professor necessarily. I'm just saying some I've met. That has led, as you know, I've written a few books, but one of them was written because of that. If Jesus died and rose again, that's a proposition. If somebody doesn't believe that, it doesn't mean I can't talk to them. It doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation. Does, none of that matters. What it does mean, though, is that if they say Jesus never existed, that both of us are not right in the same context. Why is 1 plus 1 2? I don't know if you've ever studied that. Why is 1 plus 1 2? 
Because any other answer will result in a contradiction. That's why 1 plus 1 is 2. The basis of mathematics is actually logic. Logic is the language that then gives mathematics the opportunity to, re- to do what it does. There's some things we take without going any further down. We can sit here, I mean, there's a math class where you have to prove 1 plus 1 is 2, whatever. It's like, yeah, you can sit there and do that. But the point is, there's some things you take as is, and you can't go further down from that. You just take it as is, okay? So now let's bring it back to Dar- Darwinism here. Did you and I, and you have to be careful how you word these things when you're talking about logic and laws of non-contradiction. Did you and I come from special creation such that there was nothing before us in who we are, but that we just came as we are as a package, like this is us? Or did we come through gradual processes that might have involved going through different organisms undirected? I add that word because there's actually people who believe in theistic evolution. So I add undirected, okay? Undirected by chance, randomly, is how you and I came to be. Which is it? Some people say, well, it depends on you. Your truth is good for you. And well, well, here's the problem. You have to at least acknowledge that they're both not true in the same context. You were either created or you were not created. And let's quote Charles Darwin himself, 1859, uh, Origin of Species. He says, if you can find any complex structure that could have not come about by gradual modifications over time, my theory breaks down. Charles Darwin, Origin of Species. Or oh, 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 somebody's right, he wrote another book called The Descent of Man as well. But if anything that is complex did not come about by slight modifications, then my theory doesn't work. Creation says that certain things just came, boom. Well, that contradicts that pro- premise. So there's a lot of books on this topic. I've, I've, I've done some writing and so on and so forth. The problem with this area is that if you're going to write and try to publish, you probably have, a, have to have a PhD. It's not like people are going to listen. Oh, yeah, this guy out there who's passionate about this topic. Where's his PhD? You know, oh, he doesn't have one. Some people will listen to you because you don't have your PhD, which is all right. There's many PhDs I know who say the same thing I'm saying. So my point is we have a contradiction here. Did we come from design or did we come from chance? That's, that's really what it comes down to. And my friends, I know some of you might have studied this a little bit and so on, and I'm not saying I've studied it more than you necessarily, but um, let's just say that I almost failed my other classes because of how much I wanted to study this topic. Because I wanted to get down to business. So I was watching DVDs, this and that, and summer of 2009, remember what I told you last week? I quit the medical school route? That was part of what I wanted to get down to philosophy of science and all of that. And I actually applied to Notre Dame to do my PhD in philosophy of science to focus on this book or the questions of this book. But, but my point though is that I dug in and I dug in and there's all these resources and there's so many resources. What it really comes down to though is you just have to understand that there's a contradiction. And if there's a contradiction, we have to find out which one has the evidence that we go with, right? So Darwin wrote that in 1859. We hadn't discovered many things since 1859. All of a sudden, we start discovering things, and we find out that, how, you know, one of the things that people would ask Darwin is that, where did, you get the, um, where did you get the first life form, right? Where did you get the first life form from? And Darwin said, well, um, it could have come from a soup, it could come, whatever. People would call this thing of primordial soup, and I don't know if it, he was actually, he wasn't necessarily trying to say that that's what it is, but he was trying to maybe address it in a certain perspective. I haven't read his theory on the beginning as much. His book was not talking about how life began. His book was talking about how species, you know, the origin of species and the changes and so on and so forth. Is there microevolution? Yes. Do we see minor changes? Yeah, we can see those things. But do we see macroevolution in the way that it's presented? Not really. So it becomes an issue of faith to believe that. And so Anyway, so the, the, the law of non-contradiction says you can't have both be true. So then we look at the data, we look at the details, and we lean to one side on the basis of evidence. We can talk about all that evidence. We'll, we'll dedicate some time to that if you want to look at all the evidence. But when Darwin said that, they had not seen the micro, like they hadn't zoomed into bacteria and looked at it in depth at that time. Well, we've done a lot of that research, and some people have written books on this topic. And one of the things they say is that the bacteria flagella, this is just an example, the thing that allows a bacteria to move is actually very, very complex. 
But the bacteria is supposed to be a simple organism. Bacteria is actually not simple. One of my advisors in college had a PhD in microbial genetics. That's all he did for 25 to 30 years. That's all he did. Microbial genetics. Bacteria is not simple. The theory was assuming that simple things became complex. But then we realized that's not true. The simple things are actually complex already. But if humans came from things that were supposed to be single-celled organisms, how do you explain when the single-celled organisms are complicated? My friends, these are relevant topics that are happening to people who are thinking in America. I'm sorry to tell you that sometimes we get so busy with life, we don't think about things. And I'm not saying you're not thinking, I'm just saying we get busy. I get busy. I don't know everything about everything. This is where I spend my time. But if you brought up another topic, I might not know about that. But at least I spend my time trying to dig in and learn about this. And so here's, I didn't even tell you what the deconstruction problem was. Here's what happened, I told them in class. According to Darwin, if A became B over time, you know what, I give you whatever number of years. They say, oh, billions of years will do it. Okay, let's, for argument's sake, yeah, sure, you have billions of years. An organism was A and it became an organism B. That means that at some point, an organism C had to have existed. Darwin said that, not me. He calls it transitionary forms. This is so important. Many people who grew up in other countries, you know, where I grew up in Nigeria, we never had to wrestle with this, ever. In my school, yeah, okay, we talked about this, and then the next class we had was Christian religious knowledge. So we were, we were not limited in allowing the Bible to affect what we're learning in school. And so we would go from one class to the next class, and we'll talk about the Bible, no problems at all. But my friends, especially those who are from other countries, if you look at the American education system, they're about to impose it in third grade, that you evolved in third grade. Look up the new standards. That's what they want them to take up early. America is not in the same place that some other countries are at. They're allowing some of these things and saying that this is what should be taught. And the problem is not that we shouldn't... Yeah, you should teach the other person's perspective, but don't censor the one who wants to bring another perspective. That's part of what I'm saying. If you want to talk about evolution allow people to talk about an alternative theory. That's not allowed in many schools in America. You cannot talk about an alternative theory. Or, even worse, you cannot question evolution. You can look up the research, there's been law cases. Texas had to debate this. One of my professors had to fly, he flew down and he had to debate about this in Texas because Texas was gonna determine what textbooks they were gonna use. So they flew in three people that believed a different view they flew in these other people, they had testimonies from students, and the idea was they were going to see whether or not they should do that. I think they won that case, but there's not every case that you win. I think they won that one, though. So basically what that meant is not that they're going to teach anything else, is that they can question evolution. It's a theory. Why can't I question? And so if he says A became B, so you have like this animal, and it became this animal, Darwin says we should find transitionary forms, things that are in transition. Well, here's the problem. If your worldview is such that you believe that evolution is true, then if you see this, and I actually, I think I, I might have gone on the board in class and I told them this, and you can just see the reaction of, and I, some of these things I'd never thought about, okay? I, until I was subjected to the arguments, I actually had to think about, well, how do you rebuttal that? Now, granted, praise the Lord, I grew up in a family of lawyers. They didn't necessarily teach me to debate, but I watched that. And so I, I, I went to him, I said, well, if you have this becoming this, and you look at that, if your lens for worldview is evolution, you're going to look at that and go, transitionary form. And that's what we've done. There's a lot of things now that they call transitionary form. But here's the problem. Are you ready for the problem? If your view is creation, you look at that and you say, wow, look at this distinct creature that God made. Who's right? Notice that neither person has won the case. One person is saying, Oh, look at C. It looks a little bit like A, and it looks a little bit like B, so it must be a transition form. The other person is saying, look at C. It's so distinctly beautiful. Do you see the problem we have here? One is saying one, and one is saying the other. We look at the evidence, though, and both sides have a case to make, but we've silenced one side altogether. I've known a lot of people, and some of them I can't even mention their name. Sometimes it's like, look, just know you can't mention my name until 
they tell you when they can, such and such a date, when I get tenure or whatever. And, and I get it, I understand what they're saying. But that just shows you how intense this discussion is. So there are many people who go to college and they're just hanging out, chilling. Hey, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And they're not realizing that there's a huge battle going on on the minds of young people. What will we cause young people to believe? And people, I mean, there's so many things we can get on on this, and I'm not going to go into all of it. But, you know, oh, yeah, this one, guy had a PhD, whatever. Oh, he believes in creation. He doesn't know anything. Kick him out. I mean, stuff like that. I've heard things like that. I'm like, you really are going to kick someone out just because they don't believe in evolution? Some of them are not even Christians, but they don't believe in evolution. And they're kicked out, too, because they would speak against it. I'm just like, wow. So my friends who have come to America, when I came to America, some of these things were very low. They were not key. The battle is really bad now. It's really bad. In d- 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 these things are going on. And there's PhD people debating PhD people. It's not a matter of whether you're a scientist or this or that. It's a matter of truth. Are you willing to follow the truth wherever it leads? And some people say, yes, we're going to follow the truth. So they came up with another term, which is that book I told you, Darwin on Trial, called Intelligent Design. Not creation, intelligent design with the hope that it would help explain that some things are designed and not an accident. So then the last book we read in the class was actually called Living with Darwin. And part of what the author is saying is, you gotta face the facts. This is where you're at, this is what it is. You gotta just live with it, you gotta live with Darwin. And I said, I don't agree. I don't have to live with Darwin. I don't have to live with Darwinism being the truth when it's not the truth. Not because of what I believe, but because it has logical inconsistencies within it. I gave you one example of the bacteria flagella. If you were to get a cut on your hand right now, there's 10 things called zymogens in your body. They're doing nothing right now. They're literally just floating. They're inactive proteins. When you get a cut, they get activated and they activate one another down the line. You've heard of something called hemophilia? It's part of what that's about. You have enzymes in your body that are doing nothing. And if you evolved, I really want to understand why your body was making enzymes that didn't have a place or purpose. That whole system is a package. It did not evolve. The same thing goes with the human eye. If you've never studied the human eye, look up the details. There are certain things that are useless without the other thing. And so somehow you would have had an eye that was useless and finally something woke up and the human eye started working. Those things are not valid. Those things, you end up having a lot of faith. But the problem is that one would say that, oh, I don't have faith if I believe in science. Back to what I said in the beginning. Philosophers and some scientists don't even know what science is. Science is not clearly defined. People get PhD in something called the demarcation problem, which is what I was going to focus on. And the demarcation problem is, what is science and what is non-science? You study that for five years. Then you start teaching on the philosophy of science. My point, again, my friends, is that make sure you're sharpening your thinking, whatever field you're in, no matter where you're at, be a lifelong learner that doesn't end in the classroom. And understand that what people believe has implications. Which leads to some of the implications some people have talked about that I'm not going to necessarily say I espouse to all of them now, but some of them have a basis to make that decision. One of Charles Darwin's relatives was writing to him and explained that these people, and I'm quoting, have not evolved fully. And he was referring to a group of people. They haven't evolved fully. That thinking sunk into many people's thinking. On what basis can we say someone has not evolved fully? Because they are not a certain way? He was talking about human beings, by the way. You ask yourself, why? Now, some people have written about the social dimension, the social impact of Darwinism. Again, I am not speaking on authority on that. I'm just telling you that people have written on that. And in their books, they say that Darwinism could have indirectly caused certain things in society. When you're told that the, there's a hierarchy in human evolution, some of these writings, will, we will not allow people to read them out in public. But these were books that were written and letters that were written. And so because you're from this part of the world, you're not fully evolved. So then somebody else comes and tells you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you how to do things or whatever. And, and then what do you start getting? What, what starts happening when you start treating people as a different species? You start getting some social problems. Slave trade was okay for a long time in many parts of the world. Now, granted, slave trade was happening before Darwin came. 
Okay, so I'm not saying Darwin is the one who caused it. But you ask yourself, and I've actually thought about this recently. Why did anybody think it was okay? Like, why did anybody think that you could sell people as slaves on the basis of their skin color? Why did anyone actually think that was okay? And when it ended, why did anyone think it should have ended? See, my friends, part of what has happened is that people have swept a lot of things under the rug, and they haven't actually thought it through. But if I believe in creation, then I'm not going to try and treat you as a slave on the basis of your skin color. And I'm not saying the, comp- the op- I'm not saying, oh, if you believe in evolution, you believe in slave trade. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm asking a legitimate question: Why did anybody think it was okay? What basis did they have? Again, these things were happening before Darwin. But then came a man who, his book should be somewhere here or in my, in my library, called William Oberforce. Most of you might not know him. William Oberforce went before Parliament and he says, we need to stop slave trade. What? What are you saying? Who's going to do our plantations? We need to stop slave trade. And he started his fight for the abolition of slave trade and so on. He met, apparently he even had conversations with John Newton, who, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. That man was a slave dealer as well. Uh, John Newton, until he repented and wrote, and then he wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the, the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. So William Oberforce gets to talk to this guy. There's a movie called Amazing Grace that also talks about William Oberforce. And William Oberforce starts fighting for this to end. But again, what basis does William Oberforce have to say that slave trade is wrong? He has to have a basis. And he fought and fought and fought. And one day in Parliament, they said, is hereby outlawed through more slave trade. And some of his enemies, or some of those who didn't like him, now I know the movie might have added some spice, but I think this was pretty accurate. They had to stand and clap. We, 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 this man stood for what he believed. Now of course slave trade ended, but we had other problems in society. What I'm trying to say to people is this. All men are created equal. But what is the basis for that proposition. They were created equal. People can choose to believe whatever they want to believe. You don't force a person, oh yeah, because you don't believe this or whatever. People can choose to believe what they believe, but be ready to give backing for why you say you believe what you believe. And this is no exception for Christians too. Some Christians say things, oh I believe this. You know, or some people say they're Christians on one day and then five years later, oh I'm no longer a Christian. Here's my question for you. Okay, so, so are you saying that now they are no longer a Christian, that Jesus somehow never died, he never rose. Like, what, what, what has changed? You get my point? If it was true when you believed it, and now you're not a Christian, what changed? Do you see? That's where I think a lot of young people, the statistics have been coming out. 70, 80% of American teenagers who are involved in youth group at church, over 70 to 80% are leaving the church after high school. And you wonder, why are we where we are? Right? Why are we where we are? 70, 80%, I don't know, some statistics even have it higher. And people are leaving. Meanwhile, if you believed it and it was true, then you have to explain what the basis is now for it not being true or why you don't believe it anymore. So, my friends, a lot of this is to encourage you to think. Think as hard as you can. Study, work to, to dig into these issues because they have serious implications. And, and let's not be intellectually lazy. Let's not be intellectually lazy because... It's easier to just say, well, I'm not going to do any homework. I'm not going to study this. And so now we have apathyism. People are just going to be apathetic. I don't care. Don't be apathetic. I say all of that to tell you that the law of non-contradiction applies to science, and we have to look at the implications of things that are opposing views, but we also have to look at the implications of what people teach in science. And this is not saying that if someone believes this, that means they believe that. Not necessarily. But we want to look at the basis for why they believe what they believe. So we thank God that we don't have slave trade as far as out in the open like it once was. There's other forms of trafficking going on in the world, which is another reason that we need to be in prayer and asking for wisdom for what we can do to make things right in a world that is doing things that don't make sense. And there's a lot of documentaries on that as well. So there's a lot of topics that I want to tackle, and this was just one of them, the issue of creation and evolution and the implications of belief in either and understanding the other person's point of view and understanding the implications of what you've come to believe. I want to transition to technology because I did say I was going to talk about that, but it, it, this ties to technology. And I'm going to read a poem and then we'll, that ties into technology. If I believe that I was created, then how I spend my time will be very different than if I don't believe I was created. 
So if I was created, I would spend my time recognizing that time is precious, time is scarce, and I got to cherish every moment. And so here's the poem I wrote, and then I'll transition to why it was written. It says, people are busy, carried away by distractions and idolatry, ignoring that which will enrich their soul and spirit. Instead, they're settling for temporary instant gratification. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Netflix, eating up time and turning us into zombies when we use them excessively. That's the key word. Lord, please have mercy. And please show us how to break through and reach those who don't think they need to be reached. There's a movie called The, Show- the Smallest Movie Ever Made, I believe. IBM is working on putting out a certain form of phone system that would basically be the size of my iPhone, so that memory using quantum computing. And you, that will have the capacity, when they do it and they do all they need to do, it would have the capacity to put every movie ever made on that phone. On one phone. Every movie ever made. Look it up, quantum computing and IBM. So, it's not, I'm not saying it's bad that we're doing quantum computing. What I'm saying is, if I don't know why I exist, and you give me a phone with every movie ever made, I might just waste my life. Because I got a lot of movies, there's a lot of movies you can watch, right? So see why it's important that you know why you exist before you allow technology come in and take over? Do you know how rude people are on the internet sometimes? Very rude. There are times where I've watched a video and then you just scroll down, you're like, this is a great video. And you read some people's comments and you're like, what are you saying? The reason why I say that again is when your values and your morals are not in place and you have technology, it can be very dangerous. We've heard stories of children who didn't want to go to school anymore. We've heard stories of children who took their own lives, unfortunately, because of bullying on cyberspace. Very sad. If we invented the technology, it should not determine how we live in such a way that we forget how we should live. So because of this anonymous world, sometimes people can just put whatever, and sometimes it hurts other people. And I know everybody, most, I mean, I'm not saying anybody here is doing that. I know you guys agree. I'm just telling you this is becoming a problem again, another epidemic. So how do we help young people to use technology wisely? Well, we remind them that they have a purpose for living that goes beyond the technology itself. The reason why you exist is not just for technology. You exist for something bigger. Therefore, it affects what you post on someone's page. It affects, it makes sure that you have compassion when you're typing, you know, okay, you want to, even if you're playing with someone, you make sure that they understand what, that you guys are on the same page. That you're not, you know, some things might, some people, they might not perceive it as bullying, but it's just, it's not healthy for those people. We've lost, in many ways, our society has lost its mind in terms of how it responds on a cyberspace. Because you can hide. You can hide and say whatever you want to say. And there's so many, I mean, think about the fact that cybersecurity is becoming such a big deal. Even toothbrush companies are gonna have to get cybersecurity at some point. Because there are certain toothbrushes that connect through Bluetooth ca- ca- connectivity, right? And, and I know this partly because my dentist office was talking about it, and I was like, sure, let's try that out. And so I you know, got this toothbrush, and it connects with, and, and it actually gives you tips, and it tells you what to do when, and times it, and gives you insight, whatever, and then it keeps a log. But if you hack my phone, you might get, you could, if, you hack, if you can hack through that, you might be able to get to my, do you see what I'm saying? You can hack almost anything. People are hacking cars. So my point is, why are these people going out there just trying to be mean? Like, do something else with your time. Don't be trying to hack into people's houses or people's smart devices and so on. But part of that goes back to if you don't have the value system in place, then you get into trouble when the technology comes. So, that poem was written because when you have so much, it is sometimes hard to know where to devote your time. And I understand that. There's a lot of things that we can get involved in. And so some people are just so busy. They don't have time. And... And again, I thank you for making time. You, this is called opportunity cost. You had to give up something else to be here. And thank you for doing that. And we thank God. But as I've said again, I see it as an opportunity to say, what can I tell and encourage young people as they go into the next generation? I'm going to read you one more poem, and then we'll, we'll take some questions, comments, objections before we're out the door at noon. So here's a poem. 
that I wrote because I noticed that people didn't want to. They didn't like logic. They didn't like truth. It's called urgency. It said there's work to be done. Time is short. People are hurting. The truth is revealed in the word, which we sometimes neglect. When I say people are hurting, I was partly referring to things like, or you could say things like drugs and the epidemic of that. Um, the, tr- the truth is revealed in the word of God, which we sometimes neglect. Yet we turn to the things of the world, which will not satisfy. Are we living for the reason we were created? Or do we live as though everything came together by chance? We need to be transformed and then call others to be transformed. Rise, get up and strive for perfection like it says in Philippians chapter 3. In the sense that you have not arrived, you keep growing, you keep seeking after. Like Paul says, I have not, I'm not perfect, I'm not attained, but I keep pressing on. Enough with mediocrity and low standards. Resist and flee from apathy. There's work to be done. What will you do? So I, I wrote a book in 2009 for two reasons, one because of my philosophy class and one because of another teacher who I never took their class. But they were violating the law of non-contradiction. And I wasn't the only one who was saying it. Some of the other professors who are not Christians would say the same thing. You cannot tell two people who have opposing viewpoints. Yes, we want to encourage them to, yeah, you can get along, that's fine. But you cannot tell both of them that they're right. That violates logic. And so I met that professor at a coffee shop and I said, I'm sorry, that violates logic. So I wrote a whole chapter of a book dedicated to them and I sent it to them. And I said, again, non-Christians agree that that violates logic. This is not a matter of Christian, non-Christian. It's a matter of logic. If you believe this and the other person believes the opposite of what you believe, then both of you do not believe the same thing. Neither are both of you right. Should you talk to one another? Yes. But it doesn't mean you should deceive one another by saying that you're both right. Because you're deceiving yourselves. Right? There's a man who actually wrote that he did not exist, for example. He didn't believe he existed. Well, if he didn't exist... Okay, that's, I know it's tricky, but he actually wrote a lot of books, and in it he eventually said, I can't prove that I exist, so I don't exist. Um, he was a Scottish Enlightenment thinker, I think. And, uh, but my, my point is, if he doesn't exist, and someone says he does exist, we have a problem. You see what I'm saying? You have a problem. So you have to find a way to say, okay, what is truer? What is true in that context? Now, of course, he existed, but he can say whatever he wants to say. So I read the poem, and I, and I tell you this because, again, the same way I was sensing something in August of 2015 is the same way I'm sensing something today. And here's what happened. I noticed that a lot of people did not like thinking through things. So I told my wife, I said, something is in the air. It doesn't make sense that people are just simply going with their feelings rather than going with what logic calls for. And so I mentioned that to her. And um, a few weeks later, I was listening to the radio. Okay, this is National Public Radio. And they were talking about something that was going on. And they said, so remember, I'd already told my wife, right, that people are dealing more with feelings rather than logic for making decisions. Tune up, to, listen to the radio, listen to a documentary briefly on the radio, and here's what the person says. The surveyors came to realize that when they went to survey people and when they wanted people to change their position, what they did was they hired someone who would do the survey, who had done something that when they surveyed people and the people were disagreeing, that person then tells them, oh, by the way, I am actually this way or I've done that. The people they were surveying almost always would then say, really? Okay, I don't believe what I believed then because of you. So the surveyors by asking questions, and in about an hour, would find people that were very firm in a belief system, and at the end of the hour, the people didn't believe it. They were like, you know what, you're right. Maybe this is okay. Maybe abortion is okay. That was the example. She heard that and she went, oh, I didn't used to believe abortion. Like, I didn't believe it was okay. Now it's okay, under any circumstance. The same person who they asked in the beginning, do you believe it, and they said no. At the end of it, it was saying, no, I don't believe it. And this goes on and on for many things they're doing. So it's actually a new way of surveying people where you survey them to change their view. And then the radio presenter said, we have come to realize that people no more make decisions on logic. They make it on feelings. The radio person said the same thing I said. The same thing. And I was like, that was what was in the air. Because I said, something doesn't make sense. Because you try to reason with people and a lot of them are like, well, what feels good? And what feels good? My friends, we don't live life by feelings. It's not all about feelings. I don't want everybody to act upon their feelings. Because of people's feelings, and even us at times, our feelings are not godly. They're not right at a time. So are we going to act on it? No. 
And the radio presenter said that, and I went, I can't believe it. Exactly the same thing. So guess what the term is? It's called post-truth. It's part of what the term is, post-truth. We live in a post-truth era. I don't care what you believe and the basis for what you believe or what is true or what's not true. This, this actually happened around also the campaign time uh, with a lot of the U.S. politics. And people actually are like, you know what, I don't care. I just go with my feelings. But if you believe the Bible, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. You, you, you can't go with your feelings all the time. You have to go with what's true. And what's true is not always nice. It might be hard. Self-control, right? Sometimes you're like, I just wish I could do this or that. But self-control calls you to hold back. And you hold back. So, anyways, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to end with this, the technology piece, which I know it took a long time to get to. And so I told my wife this, and I, I, I realized it more and more. I had a friend who was actually in a church that I knew about and were friends and stuff. And he ended up going into some stuff um, where he didn't believe in objective truth. Um, he read, there's a book that came out that really... It really threw a lot of people off. There's a book called Love Wings, and it threw a lot of people off. And so he ended up, he didn't believe, you know, uh, what he used to believe. And I, I was sitting with him just asking, is everything okay? Like, basically, I just became an enemy. We were friends. We did things together. All of a sudden, it's like I became this guy who's a problem. So I'm asking, is everything okay? Like, what happened? Last time I met you, we were here, and now you're like, you don't even want to talk to me or whatever. And then he's like, he must still use logic. It's not all about logic. You know, again, sometimes you got to go with the feelings. So I'm, I'm saying these things to you, not because I've only heard it here, here, where I've said it. It's actually happened. And maybe you are in that boat. Maybe you have given up on logic, and you just depend on your feelings. Feelings will not take you far. Logic stands, logic and truth stand firm. Feelings change. You don't want to live a life based on things that change every day. Am I saying you can't have emotions and so on? No, God created those things. But he gave you a mind, a brain. He gave you things to think with. Use it. When you don't use a muscle for so long, it gets weak. And that's what's happening to our young people today. They're not using some muscles that we used. They're not memorizing like we memorized. Which some of it is good. Yeah, I get that. But you have to make sure you still memorize. Exercise memorization. It's good, Right? Because what happens when we have a power outage and your phone doesn't work? What happens when there's no Google? What are you going to do? Right? Well, what are people going to do? Many people, and the problem is again, oh, let me Google it, let me Google it. Well, the problem is if you keep Googling things and you do not learn them, they don't stay. So then you Googled it and it's gone. So then when Google is gone, you, your bank will actually be lacking. Now, I'm not saying anything about Google leaving. I'm just saying, well, I mean, we never know, right? Nobody better think that something is here to stay forever. It might morph, right? Sure, people thought MySpace would stay forever. And now it's like you say MySpace, people are like, what are you talking about, right? And that's the same thing that might happen. Times come, people come, people go, things come and people go. So I said, so I'm noticing this issue of, you know, uh, you know people are depending on their feelings rather than on thinking, and I said, you know what, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and wealth lead, can lead to apathy. And we see that a lot with a lot of young people. If you don't have to work hard, why try? So we have too many gadgets to help us stay in our purposelessness. Boredom seems to be scary, a scary thing for many young people, so they can play games all day to avoid living life as it should be lived. Many parents, I spoke at a different event, this and that, and they come to me and they're like, man, I just need to get my kid off that computer. By the way, computer gaming... And what's the other one? The selfie addiction have become medical problems. One is a World Health Organization epidemic, and one is a medical problem. Does that make sense in Europe? So, um, gaming, they say some people will not leave the game. They, they won't eat. And even if they eat, they won't keep, take care of themselves. I'm not making this up. Go look it up. World Health Organization, new diseases. And then the selfie addiction, some girl was like, I got to get 200 pictures a day, you know. I'm thinking, 200 pictures? And, and one day somebody was taking a picture here. My wife came to, she was visiting or she was going to, I guess I might have been driving home with her that day. And she saw somebody inside and she was wondering, is, is the student okay? It was, and I went out, why? And I said, what? She said, was that student okay? I said, yeah, why are you asking? She seemed troubled. I said, oh no, she was taking pictures of herself on the window. And, and, and so it's like the selfie addiction. And then of course you take the selfies and then you need people to like the selfies. My friends, I know you guys are busy with schoolwork and so on. If you want to read some books about the Generation Z, 
Check them out. Check out what it says about them. And I want to encourage you to read it. Because part of my goal in Adolam is that you mentor some of the Generation Z people. But do you know that the likes on Facebook is part of what gives their life meaning? And if they don't get those likes, some of them actually get depressed. I listened to the whole book because I wanted to understand. This psychologist who just did plain research on Generation Z to understand how they think, how they behave, and they came out with some interesting research. And when you look at what's going on, if I spent, even days where, because yeah, I used to like listening to the news. If I spent the whole day just watching the news or, or trying to follow this link to that link, some days I actually feel like, I don't know if you've had this feeling where you just feel, I know you got to be careful with feelings, but I almost feel sick. Like, oh, that was, that was a long day of just following links. Why do I care to know about that and that and that? You know, you're like, you're reading about this person and then it hyperlinks to this one. And you go there, you go there. Five hours later, you're like, I just wasted my day. But I know a lot about, you know, I don't know, South America or, or, or whatever. I mean, some days you're just studying one country and then you start reading about the president. No, you start reading about the president and then you start reading about the country and then you start, it's just on and on. So we have to have limits. That's how we make it through in this day and age. We have to have limits. I need to limit how much time I go on social media. I have to put a limit. Because if I don't put a limit, I can be on it all day. Now, somebody might say, well, what's the problem with being on it all day? Well, I was created, so I have a purpose. So I need to be doing something with my life. I can't just be looking at everybody's posts all day. Which, by the way, that's another reason people are depressed. Oh, look at that guy's car. Oh, look at that guy's shoe. Oh, look at that guy's... I mean, this stuff happens. But if you have purpose, and if you know how to live... And by the way, we're going to break these videos into five or six because it's, it's long one video. But if you have purpose, then you take the technology and you use it for good. You use it for the purpose for which it was made. So let's, I'll end this and then I actually have copies of this on my website. It's, it's like the first 10 pages. So you can actually read every part of it if you want. Um, so the book, Why Do I Exist, was the fourth book that was made a book. But what I did is from now on, a lot of those books will actually just go online. People can just have it, do whatever they want to do with it. Because... You can't always print enough, or I mean, yeah, not that it's, I need a lot. I'm just saying it costs to print it, so why don't you just put it online in this case? So this book is online, it's free, you can read it, pass it on to people. But it says, we have too many gadgets that help us to stay in our purposelessness. Uh, boredom seems to be scary. In a book called America is Too Young to Die, Leonard Ravenhill, who was a preacher, says he describes the decline of empires. He said that every empire seems to decline in a certain pattern. Here's what he noticed, okay? This is one thing I didn't learn much when I was growing up. We didn't have history classes. We didn't have robust history classes in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade for people who were in science. But here's what he said in history. He said that empires start from bondage to faith. So a lot of empires can start from bondage. So even in America, think about what happened, right? America had to fight for independence. There was a bondage. So there was bondage to faith. Then from faith to great courage. From courage to liberty. We're going to fight for freedom, they say, right? From liberty to abundance. When you are free, you might then get abundance. From abundance, this is where it takes a bad turn, to selfishness. When you have a lot, it can actually get corrupted and you get selfish. I told you the example of the boy at the birthday party who, had, who already had a lot of toys. And people give him toys and some of them, he looks at some of the toys and you could see a reaction of like, like, this is not good enough. I mean, you look at the toys he has. He lives in a mansion, pretty much. And you're giving him this. Oh, okay. Thank you. You know, say thank you. And I mean, they say, say thank you. You know, and I'm looking at that going, no, that's just not right. I need to give that money to someone to have food instead of giving you another toy. So, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, here's the other bad turn. From selfishness to complacency. From complacency to apathy from apathy to dependence, from dependence to bondage. Do you see the cycle of empires? Where do you think we are on that chart? We've definitely passed liberty, right? America became a nation. We, we've talked about abundance. We, America as a nation has been blessed, right? So it's received that. Uh, have we hit selfishness? Oh yeah. Have we hit entitlement? Oh yes. Talk about entitlement mentality. Um, so it takes about four generations. That's what a historian was telling me. It takes about four generations to get to entitlement. So that's what uh, Leonard Ravenhill was quoting in his book. So this issue of wealth and abundance is discussed in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I just want to wrap it up with this. So I, I encourage you to read that chapter if you haven't already. God told them that you will go to a place and when you get there and you, when you eat and are full, make sure you bless the Lord. By the way, I'm planning a 
uh, uh, I call it an African praise night, but it's open to anybody. But I have some songs from Africa we'll sing. And I'm hoping we can do that and just thank God for all that he's done. Think about the fact that America has a day dedicated for Thanksgiving. We should live lives of Thanksgiving every day, not just on Thanksgiving Day, right? So no matter what happens in the world and the amount of wealth we acquire in any form, we have to remember that we were created to live for God. So a lot of students are being taught, of course, that that could be, you know, you evolved and so on. Well, we were created, okay? And if we want to look at the evidence, there's a lot of books we can talk about later. We were created, and therefore, we need to live lives that make sense. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. We were created to live for the glory of God. Somebody might say, well, I don't believe in God. I don't believe, you know, I don't believe that. Um, one of the most bankrupt things in the world, are you ready for this? One of the most bankrupt things is belief. There are people in the world today, I'm not making this up, there's a president of a country that just stepped down who does not believe that the Jews were persecuted or that anything, that a Holocaust happened. He believes that. Does it take rocket science to figure out that issue? There are Holocaust survivors that were still being interviewed a few years ago. But he believes it. So should I take his belief seriously? Can I encourage him? Well, then, yes, but my point is, people say things like, well, I don't believe in God. Well, belief is bankrupt without basis for it. So just because you don't believe or be, you believe doesn't mean anything. And seriously, that applies to Christians. Just because you say you believe you're a Christian doesn't mean anything. Show me the basis. Didn't Jesus even say that? You shall know them by their fruit. Where is the basis for what you're saying? Where is the evidence for what you're saying? I already talked about this issue. I recorded it. I don't know if any of you already listened to it. I might end with that today because for all you can read it. But when it's all said and done, James Lowen said that people are entitled to their beliefs and so on, their opinions, but they're not entitled to their facts. You are not entitled to your facts. Yes, you can say you believe or you have this opinion or other, but you're not entitled to your facts. And so if we're talking about the God that created the heavens and the earth, if we're talking about the one who was, in, who was before there ever was anything, who has always been, who is eternal. And if we're talking about somebody who is eternal, this is actually, I wrote this paper in the philosophy, of, uh, philosophy 101 class. I ended up taking that later. Philosophy of, uh, what was the subtitle? Intro to Philosophy. And he actually recommended it to the Philosophical Association. That became chapter two of the book. The, the point I want to make is this. If God is eternal, that means if he's never existed, he will never exist. And if he exists, he will never stop existing. And so when somebody says, I don't believe in God, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Belief is bankrupt. But if they say, oh, there is no God, now you're back again to this. You, you, you can't be both right. And my friends, I have many friends. Well, I don't have many friends now, but when I was in college, I had many friends who might not have agreed with me. But at least we could have a conversation. And they understood very well that Amos, the ones who were willing to go all the way with the logical implications, Amos, you're wrong, but we can shake hands and say, have a good day. They, could, they would say that, just as they know that I would say that, rather than us saying, you know what, we're both right, let's shake hands, buddy. God doesn't exist and God exists. doesn't make sense. But I found out recently that it's actually not a possibility to believe that. You can't actually believe that there is no God. It's actually not possible. You know why? Because if God did something, and I know some of you heard this on Tuesday, but I want to say it one more time since we're recording this. If God did something on July 1st, 1925, and he never ever does anything in the history of the world, ever, ever, he exists. And if God is going to do something tomorrow, he's never done anything before, but if he's going to do something tomorrow, he actually exists. If God does something in Nigeria, in a little pocket of Lagos, and doesn't do anything anywhere else in the world, he exists. To say there is no God is to say there is no being such that he has either been or he has. So there's never been a time in history past or will never be a time in the future where God has ever done anything at any time in any place in the universe period. That's what it means. My friends, I didn't say whether or not you believe it. I'm telling you what you're saying. Because of his nature. What's the key word in his nature? He's eternal. God is not like we're talking about somebody's father. Oh, does your father exist? Well, it depends on what you mean. He existed till... So he did, no, 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 no. We're talking about some God. You guys get what I'm saying? We're talking about someone that... And, and the thing that is mind-blowing is, of course, God has done a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. My point, though, is that a lot of people who espouse to atheism are actually doing it on the basis of, 
I just don't know. So, you know, I just want to be humble. But that's the biggest pride you can have. To say that there has never been a time that God has ever done anything in any part of the universe, period. Because if God does something in Nigeria right now, God actually exists. God does what God wants to do. He doesn't have to do something here now. We, we want him to do this. But you get my point? Philosophically, philosophers have come up then with agnostic, agnosticism. Many are moving away from atheism because atheism is actually not a possibility. What does the word A mean when you add it to a word in Greek? No. Amuse means, muse means to think. Amuse means to not think. That's why you go to an amusement park, right? You just don't want to think. You want to hang up. That's amuse. Theist. Theism is God. Atheism is no God. But you can't know that. So we have faith and we believe in God. But guess what the good news is? The Bible says I should have faith. But if you're an atheist, why do you have faith? Because you can't, right? So anyways, you can't be an atheist. I'm sorry. It's not even a thing. It's just like me saying... Um, you know, it, I, I don't believe in, 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 well, you can say unicorns. I don't even know what much about them. But somebody has used the example of unicorns. Yeah, you can say, I don't believe in unicorns or this and the other. Some of those things is like, really, do you want to be labeled as something that is, one, maybe not even verifiable, or two, something that is impossible? So, anyways, I'm glad we've recorded that. People can ponder that. And I'm actually forwarding that. So my philosophy professor read it. We, we worked through that. I sent it to the Wisconsin Philosophy Association. Now I'm sending him this one called the, the, the Impossibility of Atheism. And I actually want him to use his PhD background to help people to understand that this is a, this is a battle for logic. This is not a battle for... Notice that when I'm talking about, yes, I use the word the eternal God, but even if, we, even if you're not a Christian, you would recognize that it is impossible to say that you know enough to make the proclamation that there is none which can do those things. Like, it's impossible to do that. Who are the smartest people you've known in recent times? Some of the sharpest people. You check with them, and a lot of them tell you, I don't know much. And those same people who don't know much, how can we then say that there is no God? So, we exist for his purposes. No matter what we invent, we make sure that we allow the technology not to control us. And so this is... The end of it all. How do you live a life that makes sense in the age of technological advancement? You purpose in your hearts to live a life of purpose because God created you. You seek to have solid foundation in the truth. You make time to read the Bible to keep your mind in check. Because if you don't do that, you can lose your mind with all the distractions. I mean, just think of how much news comes out every day. Facebook, Twitter. I mean, how can you sift through everything? You need to have boundaries. So we need to proceed with caution. We need to limit ourselves. I'm going to limit myself to 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 50, you know, whatever. But whatever the case, I need to make sure that I have face-to-face interactions with people. There was a girl who was you know, at Walmart and she would tell her friend, please, can you talk to the Walmart uh, associate or the person working to help me? Can you ask them where I can find this? Oh, can't you ask them? Oh, no, 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 I'm scared. And then they went to a restaurant and they were sitting down, they were going to eat. And the girl who was scared told the other girl, you are bold. Well, why do you say that? You talk to the waitress. You're bold. And I'm thinking to myself, if we keep ourselves behind screens excessively... By the way, the American College of Pediatrics is crying. Apple, the shareholders of Apple, wrote them a letter saying, we got to find a solution to these young people and their obsessiveness with this stuff. This is true. Apple's shareholders are telling them that this is a problem. Some mothers, you watch them. Johnny, come here. No, no, no. Johnny, you got to put that down. It's like, nope. It's like, nope. This is just glued to my hand. We have to have limits. We have to sometimes even set boundaries for how we use those things. For example, if I know that if I'm going to be using Facebook by sitting on a certain chair and I can just lose, well, maybe I should get on my computer and use it, sitting down, make good use of my time, and then go out and help somebody. Go do something for somebody rather than spending four hours scrolling through Facebook, which you can do on and on. So, have deep relationships with people. Spend time with the Lord. Spend time in His Word. Focus your life. We were created, and no matter what we create, it should never become our Lord and redirect our purpose for living. Technology is not bad. It has its place. But how beautiful would it have been if Paul could Facebook Timothy? Hey, Timothy, what's going on in that church? And get a response immediately. Isn't that great? And yet, people's relationships are actually breaking down at a faster rate than before. Come, ask, people, ask people in communication. My wife studied communication, and, and, and you know, we talk about some of these things in communication. People's communication is struggling nowadays when it should be 
doing better because I can talk to people quicker. You don't have to write a letter and wait for two months or a month. You can get a reply right away. So that means that I have more opportunities to be a blessing to other people. Let us think of technology in that way. How can we use it as a blessing to other people rather than simply allowing us to keep distracting us and pushing us off? We, we just, we just stop it. So I'm going to stop. Um,